media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Work Society. Welcome back to the show, Stuart. Thank you, Jim. Stuart, what does coronavirus mean for the projects that power BC's economy, places like Site C? Yeah. These are massive construction projects that have thousands of workers. They're going to be going on for years. We know for a fact that there's tens of billions of dollars being invested this way. You know what? A lot of people, when you ask even business owners, like the BC Chamber of Commerce did, they were asked the question, what do you think are the strongest growth areas of the BC economy over the next decade? Do you know what the number one thing was, Jim, the number one sector of the economy? I'm sure you're going to tell me. I'm going to tell you. I thought I'd make you guess, but let, uh, I'll tell you what. It was tourism. So a few months ago, that's what about a 1,000 business owners, members of the BC Chamber, thought. Now, looking at the wasteland that's ahead of us in 2020 from an economic standpoint, uh, who would expect the tourism industry to contribute much or anything to the economy? Obviously, that is a very different picture. It's going to take a long time to recover. You look at the number two, high-tech that's also very high renewables. People have very high expectations of these industries. Um, but right now, we have just in a matter of days suddenly come back to a very different future, one where building a hydro dam, which is renewable electricity, uh, that we'll be getting from that when it finishes in 2023 20, or so. You look at the Trans Mountain Pipeline. As far as I know right now, work is continuing on that. And... That's another one that's going to uh, have a huge impact, not just in the B.C. economy through construction, but also, of course, in enabling eventually uh, higher value to be extracted from, from the oil that moves through it for the benefit of Alberta and all Canadians. So the third one I'm thinking of is LNG Canada. There's a site on on the coast at Kitimat where they've just sent home half the workers. Uh, if half the workers are working and they've managed the situation so that it's going to be a safe workplace and they can keep doing that, well, that's a good thing because that, that project is going to be so important, magnified in importance now. Pipeline, same thing. We're seeing a little bit of a change, uh, but but nevertheless, as of at least a couple of days ago, the coastal gas link pipeline going through the northern part of B.C. is is still under construction. Those three projects, when you take out tourism, you take out uh, retail that's going to suffer. I think increasingly over the next few quarters and years even, we're going to see the contribution of what they are making as being of, of super magnified importance. And that's why I think it's so important that Canadians rally around, even those who in the past have maybe had doubts, they've, they've got fears, can this be done safely, is it the right thing to do? You know, I, I think they, they need to get to a position of informed support for projects that will do what the rest of the economy is not able to do, which is to say, keep people working, especially people in in uh, jobs that support a whole family, as not every job does. If you're in tourism, the average wage there last time I looked was $14 an hour. Now, of course, there could be tips on top of that, but $14 an hour compared to, say, what a welder makes maybe on on double time. There's a lot of overtime for welders, especially now. They're making, you know, 100, 200 bucks an hour uh, at times, and they're certainly capable of of making 150 to 200 thousand dollars a year. So the these are great jobs to have, and we need to value them. So I think that we'll see the same in other parts of the country where there's major infrastructure projects. But but you know what, BC's particularly fortunate in that it does have those big three going on right now because. That isn't the case in, in most of the rest of the country. So um, right right there, 
despite all of the uncertainty ahead of us, I think there is some, at least some conditioning signs that that uh, there's a, a base to the economy that's somewhat predictable right now. Now, are we going to see any government protection or help for small resource-based companies or small uh, mining companies that go out and explore for gold and other minerals that are uh, either needed or wanted? Well, I would imagine it's going to be tough for them, for them because right now, typically, here we are in the middle of March, they're getting close to the time when they're uh, engaging their exploration crews to go into the field and execute their summer exploration programs. Hopefully they will be those that are unable to do so by the fundraising they've done through through the markets. Um, they'll be able to carry on with that. However, given the sudden catastrophic reduction in in share, of, share value, will junior mining companies, I don't have the answer here, and Jim, I'm really asking the question, will, yeah. will those juniors have the financial ability to to fund what they need to fund in order to do their exploration that's one question and then what if you're whether it's a summer student or a geo that you're preparing to go out there you've got your plan you know where you're going you've got everything lined up and all of a sudden the boss is saying um hold on we got to talk so what's the situation for those people i'm sure this conversation is being replicated many hundreds or thousands of times over in different companies as as they look at it uh I sure hope that they're able to uh, come to a place where the cash they've got allows them to do those programs because we will come through what's ahead. This is not a a one-way trip. It's a descent down a precipitous slope to the bottom. Well, we don't know where that bottom is, but we know that at the bottom there's a slope upward. And when that arrives, those who are developing mining properties or mining potential will be in in great demand because we're going to need, as we rebuild the global economy, we're going to need to have access to the the minerals, the the copper, the zinc, the gold, the the molly, the the stuff that comes out of B.C. and has done so for a very long time. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, at the recent PDAC uh, Prospector Development Conference uh, in Toronto, which is all about the Canadian mining industry and mining around the world, uh, there were dozens of protesters out front of the convention center, and I noticed they were all videoing the proceedings with their cell phones. Well, would that cell phone exist without mining? Well, certainly not, because last time I checked, and I've heard different numbers on this when I've asked the question, so how many m- different minerals do you need and fuels do you need to have to have a cell phone? And I've seen a count as high as about 60. I'm not sure how you get there, but I- I've seen one that seems a little more conservative and grounded, something like 30, 30-odd 30 different minerals that are required for the manufacturer. And you think things like rare earths, I mean, you can, when you're talking about, a, say, a metal, you can maybe see that if it's on the outside. You can tap it. You know that's some metal. Uh, glass, you know, that's there, but there's things you don't see invisible to the eye, like the coating on, on that glass, which is from a rare earth mineral. That is a thing which allows you to have that, that haptic control over your phone. So when you swipe, something actually happens, uh, there. That's, that's from these minerals. A lot of them come from China. They're produced in, in, uh, quantities sufficient to, to make millions of far- sm- smartphones, but they're, they're very hard to find and develop, and someone has to do all that work, um, all, all those other minerals. And, and all, of course, if you're making uh, a steel or 
any sort of alloy, you need to be able to uh, smelt that. You have to produce that. You need fuel to do that. Most of that is from coal when you're making uh, um, alloys. You need natural gas to produce um, different components of it. So you put all this together, and you've got a almost a, a map of the world's mineral assets in your hand. And to stand on the sidewalk outside of the Prospects, Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada annual meeting in Toronto, 35,000 people from, from mining from all over the world, and, 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 and tape your protest using your phone, uh, that's, that's a bit of a disconnect there, isn't it, really? Uh, plus, the plastic casing on your phone probably plastic was casing. pumped out of the ground in Alberta. Of course, yep. Yeah, oil is required to make plastics. Natural gas is required to make plastics. If you don't, if you don't have those inputs, you don't have the outputs, and you don't have those phones. So I think you know there could definitely be a more honest conversation. We did a survey at ResourceWorks uh, a couple of years ago, but we worked with Ipsos, which is a, a world-known brand in polling. We wanted to understand what British Columbians thought about about the conversation around natural resources, which seems so conflict-oriented and and so difficult at times. And there is a high sense that there is a lack of, of trust and openness. I think it could be on all sides that this exists, but I, I think that there is, when you see uh, things like this example, or you see those protesters going to Burning Mountain in their pickup trucks, or when they're at the BC legislature and these students or younger people storm the steps and they occupy it for a week or so, and the first thing they do is they're, they're asking people to bring them propane, you, you wonder, you know, what What are you thinking? Here you are, consumers, enjoyers of the the miracle of the modern supply chain and the utilization of hydrocarbons and minerals that we make, all of which have to be done in a sustainable, environmentally sound way, and yet you're up there um, ma- making statements that are often, although they might come from the heart, they they often don't come from the head, and so uh, I, I think for the, the the general public, because that's who those small groups are trying to influence. They're trying to they're trying to affect the politicians that you voted for to make those politicians pursue some extremist policies. That's what this is about with these protests. Um, you you really I think as a citizen you have a right to speak up and and speak the truth when you see this misalignment between how people live and and what they say. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, should be people asking what's their investment strategy right now, and should we be talking about the things that they stand for when they put their money on the line? Yeah, well, this is a, a tough question. The, the people to get advice from are professionals, and I just want to say that up front. I'm not in any sense an investment professional. I've got decades of experience as a uh, journalist covering business and finance, so I, I do know my way around here, but this is not investment advice in any sense, especially in these turbulent times where it seems like each day – is a whole new drama with different market psychology to it, different trends, different things happening. Although by the time this is broadcast, you know, who knows what could be happening on that day. Right now, today, we're looking at uh, 13 or 1200 points down on the Dow Jones. We're seeing something that I've never seen before, which is the day when stocks and bonds both drop. Usually, if stocks are going down, bonds are going up in a, you know, general sense. Well, there's a departure from stocks and bonds into cash, government bonds, 
there's probably some people buying gold. I don't know. I haven't, don't have the evidence for that, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and so this is char- uncharted territory. You know, who knows what to do? And when you see people w- wanting to go in there, people will be asking questions like, is this the bottom? Well, what's happening right now is that investors are looking at uh, uh, things like transportation and tourism stocks. You know, Boeing is down uh, a horrifying amount. They're realizing that, wait a minute, people are going to be holed up at home for weeks or longer, and they're not going to be driving their cars around like they normally do. So are they going to be consuming uh, transportation fuel? Well, obviously not. Uh, what does it do for restaurants if you're you know, owning stocks that are invested in hospitality shares, hotel chains, resorts, that kind of thing? Disney, uh, I haven't looked at it, but I'd be surprised if they, they haven't been hit. Although at the same time, people might be at home consuming Disney movies and pay as you go. So, you know, some of these stocks are going to be a more mixed story. Um, but a lot of investors, if you're like me, you know, years ago, I used to be in a lot of individual stocks. I enjoyed the research, knowing a stock, confident enough to buy it and track it. Um, these days, I, I really just am in ETFs and, and I'm not sure what I would do if I was, you know, going into a market right now. Would you be making forecasts for yourself on where energy is going? I think it would be hard to do. Where is the price of gold going? I don't know. Uh, entertainment, is that a short-term or long-term thing that people won't be traveling around going out? Uh, how long will it last? Will it, you know, we're hearing all this new information about the, the way in which this coronavirus uh, epidemic will unfold, and uh, often it's contradictory, but also the depth of knowledge we're getting is getting deeper and deeper uh, every day as we get new predictions based on more information so it's possibly uh, more accurate information and so you can be forecasting ahead to you know whatever it might be months or uh, more than a year before we know the new direction so um, for, for anyone who's got any exposure to investments in in basically anything uh, from real estate to stocks to bonds um, you're, you're you're facing some tough choices. Uh, hopefully, there's going to be, from the financial ec- experts, I would be reading the business pages, looking for what uh, experts are doing. Um, it's going to be very easy to follow emotional urges where you you feel strongly that you should do this or that action. And um, that's such a personal choice. And I think if you can at least in making that choice, be as informed as you can be. Um, you know, take take your time before uh, making decisions. Maybe talk to your spouse. Just be confident that you you have come to a place that's right for you. And uh, um, you often hear advice. I think this is good advice from the the personal planners. Never try to time the market. And I think that's probably a fundamental truth that remains in place now as much as it ever has been. That if you're thinking, okay, this is when I buy because it's going to go up, or or this is when I sell because it's going to go down, um, it, almost no one ever makes a lot of money on hunches like that. Of course, there's always the equivalent of a, a lottery winner, and you hear about those people, but it's not the norm at all. So um, the, these are these are important life decisions, and and uh, do as much much research as you can would be my thought. Now, of course, a lot of people have been told uh, work from home if you can, and uh, I'm lucky. I work at home, and I get to talk to very intelligent and engaging people like you every day. So that helps keep your spirits up. We always have uh, great conversations before we start our interviews and sometimes afterwards. But for the average person, perhaps ordering widgets or whatever, uh, is it easy to get to despondent and uh, is it hard to keep your spirits up when you're a one man team or a one person team? Well, I think in times like this, it can be for those who are relocating from maybe medium, large or small uh, corporate situations, workplaces, and suddenly they're at home and they're not used to that. You know, I'm used to having a home office. I do a lot of work in my home office. As you know, Jim, I travel around a lot. I do a lot of uh, speaking and meeting people all the time. Um, I'm going to be missing that personally. And one, one thing I've been watching is what the kids are doing in education. You know, the, the tutor my son uses to, to 
get a little sharper on the math. His little company, just a couple of people working out of their home. They're school teachers, but I guess, I guess they want to have their own business. They've gotten onto Facebook Live, and now they're hosting kids. They've got these free seminars. You know what? In the time that the whole uh, government education system is still humming and hawing about how it's going to handle reaching thousands, tens of thousands of students with curriculum, you've got some entrepreneurial solutions. It's possible because of technology, and you think, when I see something like that, I think, well, what could I do with that? Well, you know, what if you're in a business where you do want to maintain contact with your clients? There is expert information that you wish you could share, or maybe you want to problem solve together. You know, maybe you can do a Facebook Live with your with your colleagues or your clients, or maybe you, now everyone's talking about Zoom. This is another one of these tech companies out of San Francisco. It's a, it, it's a, a chat, a video chat company, kind of like uh, Skype, but it's, it's got the robustness to the model that it can be suited to any sort of use. You can have a, a multi-camera uh, conference call or a webinar using Zoom. And, and now apparently teachers are using it for uh, delivery of, of their curriculum. But imagine you wanted to maybe um, have a briefing on pandemic issues for your business and you got together and you said, let's, let's call that expert in from wherever and have a Q&A or a brown bag or whatever you'd call if that was a brown bag or at home, um, a sandwich <laughs> type of seminar where you can share knowledge and make a habit of it. I think you don't see people right now and those who are in decision-making and, and positions of responsibility in their companies, they're not only worried about the business success, but they've got to look after their people too. What are ways that you can think about the, um, the, the, the times that people might be going through and how you can help them to keep their spirits up and give them something to do. Um, you know, responsible employees will be at home doing their jobs, but they're going to find things are a bit slower. They can't reach their clients. Everyone else is bunkering in. But maybe you can find something for people to do. Maybe it's that project that just never quite makes it on your top three to-do list, but you want to get it done. Maybe there's something you can bring your team together around to brainstorm on how are you going to prioritize or strategize for, for next year or deal with some some difficult problem but but above all you know keep the spirits up um people are going to be cooped up they might have the whole family at home and uh they want to have a little reprieve from that so you give them something to do i think technology and it's it's not even stuff that costs money either you don't have to go and get some you know tech solution you don't even need to call it you can probably get your your teenager to set you up because they're at home with you too may as well put them to use um, so I, I think these will be times where a lot of people discover novel uses of, of the, the medium point of technology and work, and we see lots of interesting innovation happen. Do you think, because uh, up until this point, a lot of uh, sectors had labor shortages, they worked really hard to get knowledgeable, hardworking people to work for them, that they'll be a little more careful when it comes to having to let people go to maintain their businesses, and will governments encourage them to keep those valuable employees because they were very hard to get in the first place? Yeah, well, it's going to be, imagine you're a, a, a business that is large in scale, you've got tens of thousands of employees maybe, and the, suddenly there's no revenue. And it's it's then a question for the leadership as to, you know, what are their reserves, what are their ability, what is their ability to balance this loss of trained knowledge should people not only uh, no longer get paid, but then make their own decisions as to whether they are going to go and do something else and not be available when they're wanted again. You know, if they're not there, you've lost all that all that uh, knowledge and skills. So what is the tolerance of the balance sheet to maintain a degree of, of uh, workforce engagement? I've already seen a couple of examples where you have people coming in just for a short time or being on the clock for a short time, at least they're working, at least they're drawing something, and then everybody is able to feel they're equitably drawing, and it's not an unfair situation. Because I think, you know, people will, when, when people think things are unfair against them, uh, it compared to when they believe that it's a fair situation, you have fundamentally different attitudes and behavior that come from that for good reason. Um, you know, if you're fair to people, and you can show that, that what you're doing is the best that can be done and everyone is treated equally, then 
I think people will do almost anything to um, stay part of that story. But then if it starts to go the other way and perceptions are that, you know, it's it's uh, corporate uh, greed or management is short-sighted or management is getting um, paid but workers aren't and it's unfair, like, do you know, put yourself in the shoes of, of people who, who really just respond to um, their sense of fairness more strongly than many other factors in their lives and be fair. I, I mean, uh, some people have suggested perhaps the government mail out a uh, $1,000 to everyone and they can claw that back at a later tax return time if your income was high enough. But, you know, there's that big lag if you have to line up somewhere to ask for government aid and then how long it takes for it to get there. Would that be a solution is you can always get the money back later, but get it into the hands that need it the most, the fastest. Yeah, as frictionless as possible. Who wants to fill up forms and, and then... You know, you run into these bureaucratic uh, rules set up. Uh, make it as frictionless as possible. You think we look at these surveys every year. I think the Bank of Canada does a survey. It's always the same depressing stat, basically, that uh, people have got, the average person has got, you know, a couple hundred dollars in the bank account for a rainy day. You know, you hear the financial planner saying, have three three months of salaries tucked away for, for uh, unexpected circumstances. Well, who does that? Is there anyone who, who's even if they want to, is able to pull that off? I don't think so. Most people are on a razor's edge at the best of times. And right now, probably some are already tipping into the point where they literally have no ability to put food on the table for their children, and they're going to be at the food bank. Um, they're, they're going to be looking for anything. So, uh, you know, especially given the low interest rates, it's not going to be that hard for business, for governments to use their, their borrowing capacity to uh, ensure that the cash people need just to just to exist uh, is going to be available. We could be very quickly, you know, every day in in the past week is is like a week in normal time, or even longer. And I think that that pace of change will accelerate. You know, we're going to be seeing, you know, I I think in a week or t- two weeks from now, the situation in Canada will be utterly unrecognizable from what it is now. Uh, there's going to be a uh, for for those who who don't have any resources to 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 coast on for a while, um, which is most everybody, it's going to get leaner and leaner. So yeah, go- governments are of the people and for the people, and this is the time for them to do everything they possibly can to get us through this because there is there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We we don't know how long that tunnel is, but we know we will get through it. And uh, in the Second World War, no country mobilized more than Canada. We're out of a population of 10 million people. Over a million were in uniform. We're the kind of country that can and will pull together. Yep, people are already, we've seen this uh, in Britain. They're writing about, they, they can't believe in Canada what we're doing, knocking on doors of, of neighbors, and they have a, a phrase for it, which the Brits were marveling over, caremongering rather than <laughs> scaremongering, and that, that one's catching on. I've, I've got friends I see in social media who live in apartment buildings. I don't live in an apartment, but we've got neighbors. Um, but but, but apart, apartment dwellers are making sure that those those people on their floor who are elderly and can't get out, someone's knocking on that door and asking, how are you doing? Do you need some shopping done? And the answer uh, is often, yes, I do. Thank God you've come to my to my door to help me out because they they wouldn't know what to do otherwise. So it it does make a difference what each one of us can do. Yeah. Stuart, they've closed the border to all but essential personnel and uh, commercial traffic. Will this actually speed up the passage of goods because the customs officers won't be dealing with Monday day-to-day travelers? Well, that's a really good point, Jim. I'll bet you're right because you look at the amount of of, uh, freight that moves pretty much everything. By, by trucks. We depend on that. I ran the numbers. I, I found this number sounds low, but I, I think we import at least $33 million a day worth of food from Canada, from the U.S. into Canada. And that all comes by truck. Maybe there's a little bit by air freight, I guess. And but rail. Mostly it's on, on wheels. Yeah, some rail, no doubt. And, and we, we utterly depend on that. When you look at the car manufacturing industry in central Canada, a car, I've seen the stat on it, I forget the exact number, but 
apparently a car uh, and its components move across the border while it's being built a dozen times or so. And that's all by trucks as they move around those those pieces in this distributed manufacturing system that we've got. So it's impossible to imagine the U.S. border being sealed off completely, but but uh, for freight traffic, um, I was looking at one border crossing, the fourth largest over the Lewiston Bridge down at uh, Detroit, or Ni- Niagara, rather, and they, they have had pretty steady traffic. Um, look, we should be so grateful right now for the trucks that move goods around. We we see them uh, in, in traffic all the time. People might say, oh, what's that truck doing blocking my lane? Th- those are the ones we should be thanking now as we think about the contributions that they make because we wouldn't have food in the stores if it wasn't for for the truckers out there, whether it's the short-haul ones around town moving it from the warehouse to the stores or the ones moving it over vast distances, whether it's from the Central Valley of California bringing our veggies up here or anything else that comes up. And, of course, we send a lot of food to the states. We we are still the, the bread basket here. We, Let me just summarize it this way, Jim. So when we see a trucker on the road, just be appreciative. There's someone who's feeding your family. Hey, Stuart, uh, are you getting more information about the cross-border travel and restrictions between Canada and the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. Um, there is, I think, going to be needed a little more definition around what is essential travel and supply chains. Because if we're restricting movement across the border to that, it's going to be very important to understand that there are many goods and services that play a very crucial role in keeping the critical infrastructure and services up and running. And these critical infrastructures that we require for everyday life and and safety and protection, they depend on suppliers and resources from both sides of the border. So we need to make sure that we don't have border agents randomly declaring some things to be essential or not essential when, in fact, they are absolutely necessary for our public health system to operate. So uh, there, there's going to have to be um, a clear set of directions issued to the border guards to make sure that the intention behind this this border closure is carried out in practice. Stuart, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Work Society. You can find him on Twitter at SJ Muir. His website, resourceworks.com. If you have any questions for Stuart or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Howstreet. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.